Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 24 of Guyton and Hall's medical physiology textbook which covers circulatory shock and its treatment. If you're feeling generous please feel free to give this video a like and subscribe it really helps out the channel and if you're in need of the textbook there is an affiliate link in the description. So it starts off by describing what circular shock actually means and essentially it just means poor perfusion to the body tissues. So there is not enough oxygen and poor removal of waste products. Now circulatory shock can occur for for two main reasons. One, because the heart is unable to pump the blood around the body, so the pump is defective, so then the tissues aren't receiving that blood. Or there is poor venous return, so st something is stopping that blood from returning back to the heart to then get pumped around the body. And the main reasons for both of these problems, so let's say issues with the pump, we have myocardial infarction, toxic states, severe heart valve dysfunction, and heart arrhythmia. So an abnormal heartbeat, all making that pump less effective. Reasons for a decreased venous return, so a poor return of blood back to the heart include a diminished blood volume, reduced vascular tone, which can occur in septic conditions, or obstruction to blood flow. And these causes all result in reduced cardiac output. However, you can also have circulatory shock without a reduced cardiac output because of reasons such as an excessive metabolic rate or abnormal tissue perfusion patterns. And during circulatory shock, we get a reduction in blood pressure. And then ultimately, the reduction in blood pressure leads to even more shock because the reduction in blood pressure reduces the perfusion to the heart. The heart then becomes dysfunctional regardless of whether it was dysfunctional before or not. And then now the heart starts to stop working as well. So there is a vicious cycle to shock where if it's not treated or it's not corrected then shock will eventually lead to death. Now there are three stages to shock that we should talk about. Number one is the non-progressive stage which just basically means that the shock can be corrected by the own body's compensatory mechanisms that we'll talk about very shortly and we've already discussed before in previous chapters. So the body itself is able to correct the shock and maintain normal perfusion and then recover. We have the progressive stage where this will result in death if you do not provide any therapy and if that continues you end up with the irreversible stage and that just means that despite therapy there's already enough damage done that shock is going to perpetuate regardless of what interventions you perform. So this diagram here shows us how shock progresses relating to hemorrhagic shock. So if we are actually actively bleeding, which reduces our blood pressure, reduces our cardiac output. So if we have a reduction in blood volume, a reduction of 10% barely does anything. But as soon as we start to reduce more than that, then we start to get a reduction in cardiac output. But our compensatory responses are able to keep arterial pressure normal. So that's our sympathetic reflexes. So arterial constriction, constriction of the veins to increase venous return and also increased heart activity. So they're able to maintain a normal arterial pressure when 15 to 20% of blood volume is removed quite easily and even up to 30 to 40 percent. Without the sympathetic nervous response that 15 to 20 percent blood volume loss will have an impact. Now after that then we start to get a reduction in blood pressure if we have a greater percentage of blood removed. We get up to the around 35 40 percent on this graph. We do get a slight plateauing all because of that central nervous system ischemic response that we have discussed in the past. That overwhelmingly high sympathetic surge which really stops the kidneys from doing anything so they all just hold on to sodium and water there's no production of urine you have massive vasoconstriction increased heart rate heart contractility we get a slight plateauing but then once that's exhausted we have a sudden reduction so removal of 45 percent of blood volume will result in death and as all this is occurring the blood pressure is trying to be maintained to really maintain coronary and cerebral circulation so those are our big key too because we want the heart to maintain its normal perfusion and we want the brain to have enough oxygen otherwise we end up with permanent brain damage. Now there is something called progressive and non-progressive hemorrhagic shock which back in the day they did a pretty brutal study where they just bled animals 
a certain percentage of their blood volume and then just waited to see if they could respond. And what they found is that once you reach this critical level of around 45 millimeters of mercury, if you reduce the blood pressure by that amount, if you don't go lower than that, then the body is always able to respond and recover. But if you go below that 45 millimeters of mercury, too much damage gets done and you will end up with death. So there is some compensatory response, but they end up failing because there's just too much damage and that will result in progressive shock and eventual death. Now, if we talk about compensated shock, we go, can go through each of the factors that actually contribute to maintaining normal cardiac output. So then we are able to recover from say a minor bleed. Um, and we've touched on all of these factors before in the previous chapters. So we'll just kind of list them off here. And if you need to dive into them deeper, then there is uh, more information in the previous chapters. So the baroreceptor reflexes get initiated immediately. The central nervous system ischemic response, which is a powerful sympathetic stimulator, which occurs once we start to have a real dramatic reduction in blood pressure. Reverse stress relaxation of the circulatory system. So if the blood vessels suddenly lose their blood volume they're going to constrict down. Increased secretion of renin, so activation of our RAS cascade, so then we produce angiotensin 2 to cause vasoconstriction and retain salt and water. Secretion of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone which helps to resorb more water and maintain our blood volume. Increased secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine from our adrenal medulla which helps to perform peripheral vasoconstriction, vasodilation of our coronary circulatory system and then we have compensatory mechanisms that return volume back to normal so absorption of large amounts of fluid in the intestinal tract and conservation of water and salt by the kidneys and also an increased thirst so these mechanisms down the bottom here are more of a, a longer term response these first ones are more immediate so baroreceptors occur pretty fast same with the sympathetic nervous system the RAS cascade occurs a little bit later and then the uh, reabsorption of water and maintain blood volume occurs a bit later on as well. So that is the, how we respond. And this figure here, figure 24.4, shows us our cardiac output curve that we've gone into great details with in the past chapters. Uh, it shows that over time, this cardiac output curve slowly diminishes down. So we get a reduction in our cardiac output capacity and also an increase in right atrial pressure. So this figure 24.3 also shows how shock is a positive feedback loop which remember positive feedback if we go all the way back to chapter one of this book is typically something that propagates into a vicious cycle and isn't helpful in the end um, so with this positive feedback loop our decreased cardiac output ultimately results in a decreased cardiac nutrition decreased nutrition of tissues and intravascular clotting all of those factors end up with cardiac depression and decreased venous return Turn. So a reduction in our ability of our pump to work and the reduction of blood returning back to the heart, which all just reduces our cardiac output once again. So this little flow diagram here goes through each little component and just shows you how a decreased cardiac output propagates itself to re continue to reduce its cardiac output as the heart starts to fail and as blood fails to return back to the heart. So it is a vicious cycle and needs to be corrected. And we can touch on a couple of these factors here now where we can have vasomotor failure where reduced blood flow to the actual vasomotor center in the brain results in peripheral vasodilation as the vasomotor center becomes depressed reducing our venous return now our blockage of small vessels can occur because there's just with that reduced cardiac output there's less movement through the vessels so then the blood actually starts to sludge up and clot and then you get blockage of all your blood capillaries so now blood is now struggling to actually get through the tissues to eventually return back to the heart so all that massive clotting can then also cause something else called disseminated intravascular coagulation which is a, a really horrible component of shock where you have massive clotting within all your tissues because all of the blood vessels are getting sludged up and then they use all the coagulation factors which we haven't touched on yet we'll get into in further chapters later on in the book but once you use up all your coagulation factors suddenly you can't clot so now you start to 
bleed in all your tissues too. So you have massive clotting and bleeding everywhere. And that's called disseminated intravascular coagulation. And uh, that's, that's a devastating disorder that typically leads to death. To follow on with that, we also have increased capillary permeability. So not only are we having a reduction of blood returning to the heart, you've got fluid leaking out of the capillaries into the tissues. So you're having a further reduction of blood volume. You can get a release of toxic substances such as histamine, serotonin, and tissue enzymes that can just cause further vasodilation. In addition to that, we can have the bacteria within the intestines release endotoxin as the intestines start to lose their perfusion, start to die. Endotoxin goes and damages the heart, causes widespread vasodilation, reducing venous return. And then the liver starts to get really impacted because it has such a high metabolic rate that reduced perfusion to the liver starts to result in liver failure. So this also occurs with all our other organs too, but it's more pronounced in the liver, more pronounced in the lungs and the kidneys, and we start to end up with widespread organ failure or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome or MODS. We can also get the development of acidosis throughout the body because now we're losing oxygen supply to our tissues. So they start to try to re-establish or reproduce energy through anaerobic respiration. And as we should know, anaerobic respiration results in the production of lactic acid. So we get a huge production of lactic acid. Acidemia then starts to just make enzymes less functional and we end up with massive organ failure as well. And all of these factors gets us to this point of irreversible sh shock where regardless of treatment, even if you're able to re restore cardiac output as shown in this figure here, where we've started to get into irreversible shock given a transfusion or re-established cardiac output. We have so much damage to all the organs, to all the capillaries, that we just cannot reverse that damage and we end up with a reduction in cardiac output regardless. So this irreversible shock state um, is really horrible and occurs due to massive organ failure really. And another component is the reduction of our high energy phosphate reserves because ATP starts to get broken down to ADP, gets broken down to AMP, and then that last phosphate bond starts to get used as we, our energy supply starts to run low. And then we end up with adenosine that gets rapidly converted to uric acid and can't be used anymore. So now even though cardiac output has been restored, we don't have any stores of ATP or any way to actually regenerate ATP because that adenosine has been lost. So we end up with an actual energy starved state. Now hypovolemic shock can also occur due to purely plasma loss and that can occur with intestinal obstruction that blocks all of the venous return to the intestines and then we get leaky capillaries and loss of plasma within the actual abdomen and severe burns too. So severe burns can really just cause loss of plasma through the skin and that can result in hypovolemic shock. We can also have neurogenic shock which is purely just an increased vascular capacity because of a neurological disorder which loses all your vasomotor tone you suddenly have a massive reduction in your mean systemic feeling pressure so then your heart doesn't actually receive any or receives a dramatic reduction in blood returning to it so then your venous return gets low and you end up with a very poor cardiac output because of that. Now causes for this include deep general anesthesia, spinal anesthesia and brain damage too. Anaphylactic shock is really just massive vasodilation everywhere around the body and that occurs due to really histamine or histamine like substances and they increase our vascular capacity so cause massive vasodilation reducing venous return, dilation of arterioles which you know really uh, makes the heart have to pump harder or you know there's not enough blood and heart capacity to be able to pump blood to all of the vasodilated vessels so cardiac output reduces and then also a reduced capillary permeability so we get leakage of plasma throughout the body so our blood volume not only relatively gets reduced because of all this dilation we also actually have a reduction of blood volume because of uh, leaky capillaries and that occurs, you know, during anaphylaxis reactions. Now, a similar mechanism occurs during septic shock, and that occurs due to gram-negative bacteria, which have an endotoxin that can directly harm the heart, but then also result in massive vasodilation and increased capillary permeability. 
and the special features of septic shock include high fever, vasodilation, high cardiac output, sludging of blood, and then microclots that can result in this disseminated intravascular coagulation that we talked about just previously. So now that we've talked about the causes of shock, which is just, you know, a poor perfusion to the tissues around the body, how do we treat it? Really, one of the mainstays treatment for shock is the infusion of fluids trying to restore our blood volume and restore cardiac output. Plasma in blood is by far the most effective because it's just restoring what's being lost, but you can have other substitutes too, such as just isotonic fluids or dextran, which acts like a colloid um, because it's a large polysaccharide of glucose that almost acts like a plasma protein, so it acts as a colloid-like substance. We haven't really got into colloids or anything like that in this book, but really this book isn't focused on uh, you know treatment and pathology. It's a, a nice basic overview of why we treat for physiology. So we won't dive into that too much, but really we we're just trying to restore that blood volume. Now, in terms of drugs we could try, that includes, you know, sympathomimetic drugs are so trying to help the sympathetic nervous system. So norepinephrine, epinephrine, and these are especially useful when we have shock that's causing massive vasodilation as its primary cause. For instance, anaphylaxis and neurogenic shock shock uh, that really helps to cause vasoconstriction and counter that vasodilation that's occurring. Other therapies include, you know, putting, going into the head down precision to help cardiac return um, as blood can return back from the feet. And then oxygen therapy can be tried, uh, but you know, it's not a problem of oxygen getting diffused in the lungs. So it's it's not really the, the primary mechanism here. It's, it's the problem is blood getting moved around the body. So providing oxygen isn't necessarily going to help that. And then that, right at the end here, it talks about, you know, the effect of circulatory arrest on the brain. And really five to eight minutes of total circulatory arrest can result in permanent brain damage. So that's why we want to, if you have a heart attack, perform CPR as soon as possible so then you can at least get some oxygen to the brain. Now, 10 to 15 minutes always results in permanent damage to your mental power. So I'm definitely trying to restore your circulation as, as one of the most important components of shock. I hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free to drop a comment. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next chapter.